thank you very much for coming. It's uh, great to see so many of you here, uh, especially uh, in the big room. I think this is the best crowd we've had so far, so thank you. I see a number of familiar faces, um, but if this is your first time, welcome. Uh, we hope to see you again. Uh, this is the uh, 29th tutorial that we've put on. Uh, this is a joint program between work in San Francisco and my firm, Wilson Sonsini, Goodrich and Rosati. And uh, we are trying to provide useful information to uh, entrepreneurs in all sorts of areas. Uh, we're very uh, excited today to have uh, Joseph Ancinelli from Greylock Partners uh, joining us. Um, we'll be talking about making your business plan bulletproof. Uh, and I think it should be very interesting. Um, also, afterwards, um, I'll be talking about a recent um, study that we've been doing on valuations, first round equity valuations. Um, uh, in, uh, that we've seen of deals that we've been doing. So we try to end exactly at nine so people can get to their regular jobs, but if you can stay around, please feel free to do so. Um, it'll be in room 645. Um, and uh, it also usually develops into a general discussion of anything you'd like to know um, that about um, starting up companies uh, from the legal side or even beyond the legal side. So please come join me for that. Next session, we know it's going to be on the, um, actually it should be Thursday, uh, June 20th, but we're still trying to come up with uh, what we're going to present. But if you have suggestions uh, for it or any other uh, presentation or do you have requests or things you'd like to see, please, uh, please let us know. We'd be delighted to tune the production for, um, for exactly what you guys want. And then finally, I'll just remind you that, uh, that uh, you can find all the um, uh, all these presentations on the web, uh, and go back and look at any of them. So uh, feel free to, to catch up on that way if uh, this is your first time. With that, Joe, thank you very much for coming and joining us, and take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. How are you? You guys have not had enough caffeine yet. <laughs> I haven't either. So um, well, it's great to be here. Um, I am um, just put this here so I can hide it away. Sorry. You know, I asked for the list of all the attendees beforehand. I always like to sort of get a sense of like who's going to be in the audience. And uh, you know, I want to call my dad and check some people out randomly. I have to, I have to be honest, I was a little nervous. Um, you know, there's, like there's some people here with some great degrees and some great backgrounds and some folks that graduated summa cum laude and magna cum laude. I went to Penn undergrad, went to Wharton undergrad, and I actually graduated, thank the Lordy. So <laughs> if you guys can just go easy on me today, that would be great. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, um, this is a presentation I actually started before I got into venture, which is sort of like a top 10 list of things to think about if you're starting a company. And then after joining Greylock, people said, oh, can you do a presentation about raising money? And I went back to this presentation, I was like, you know, it's actually very, very similar. So the presentation is going to kind of cover a little bit of like, if you're starting a company, like what should you be thinking about? And then also what investors are thinking about, if that makes sense. Um, but I'd love to sort of ask people, are there any particular topics that you'd like to get covered today? Don't be bashful. Come on, somebody. There we go. Good. Angel versus VC funding. Yep, no problem. Yep. We'll tell you a great lock of evaluation. Evaluation in entry or exit? <laughs> uh, entry first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. So, building on the angel investing angle, uh, if, you, if you're starting out as an angel investor, how to um, identify and the best places to find opportunities to be invested. Deal flow? Deal flow. <laughs> Uh, we have dabbled in China and Israel and India. And <laughs> 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 yeah. Right. Yep. For the uh, just your thoughts on what you should put into the financial sections of your business plan? Should it be a realistic or do you just insist on having a <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you right now, that's, uh, that's actually an easy one. 
the way I tell everyone about your financials is it's better to be roughly right than absolutely wrong. And, you know, I think it depends on the stage of the company. Yeah, so we can talk about that. Yeah. yeah. In terms of, um, <laughs> Did I just say that? Well, this is recording. I'm going to be in trouble. Yeah. So your view on uh, cloud funding, how is, that, uh, how is that viewed as the first round of funding following with the venture capital fund? Crowdfunding and the view on what that looks like from a VC's perspective. Yeah. Um, how do you think about setting milestones that work for the VC, but not necessarily Yep. Start maybe with a little bit of background uh, of me. Uh, as you know, I'm a partner at Greylock. I don't know how familiar people are with Greylock. We're uh, a firm that we don't really get into the spotlight too much, um, but if we have a moment to brag, we will. Um, Greylock has been around since 1965. Our current fund is about a billion dollars. In the last decade, there have been three companies that have been started that are now worth more than 10 million that are public, and we were the only VC to invest in all three. Pretty proud of that. So it's Facebook, LinkedIn, and Workday. And then of those two, two of the founders of those companies are also partners. So Lee Hoffman, who was the founder of LinkedIn, is a partner at Greylock. And Anya Lusri, who is the CEO and founder of Workday, is also a partner. Uh, we also invested in, uh, we invest in consumer technology and enterprise uh, companies, um, <coughs> and some of the other recent public companies have been Palo Alto Networks on the enterprise security side. Um, Pandora, as you know, Pandora is also one of our early investments as well. I joined the firm about a year ago um, and spent most of my career actually as an entrepreneur. So I didn't get into, I was not like, I didn't plan to get into venture, I didn't come out of banking. Um, I was sitting there coming up with crazy product ideas, eating pizza at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, I went to Penn undergrad, it's actually where I started my first company. I started my first company on Penn's campus with some guys from the engineering school. And it was a personal information manager, which basically think of like Outlook for the Mac back in 1991. And um, ended up getting bought by Apple. And I was like, wow, I was 23 years old. And I was like, everybody should do this. This is like the most amazing thing in the world, not knowing that ignorance is probably the most important ingredient for being a successful entrepreneur. Because if you knew actually how hard it was, you'd never do it. But I kept doing it. Um, I was at Apple for a number of years. I worked on this thing called Newton, which was like my first massive failure, and it was actually a really good thing to go through, and I'll talk about that. Uh, I left there and joined a company called Mac Media, which was successfully acquired by Adobe, and I launched a business there called Dreamweaver. If anyone's ever done any web publishing, I wrote the business plan, came up with the idea for that product, and also launched this thing called Shockwave, which became Flash. Um, and that, while being there, gave me inspiration for my first venture-backed company called Connectify, which was the idea that email would be this incredible tool for communicating with <coughs> This was 1997. And um, it would be awesome to have this platform, this software platform that companies could use to do direct marketing to people, launch that company. And then emerging with a company called Kana, we took it public in 1999, and unlike a lot of companies in 1999, we actually had $100 million in revenue, uh, and we're a real company. Um, and then with the head of engineering, started a security company because we, saw, we were dealing with all of this data inside of all these call centers and marketing departments, people's private information, credit card numbers, et cetera, and we saw all the time how people were sending it out over Hotmail and all these other things. We started a security company to help prevent the loss of data. Benchmark is a series A, I was the CEO. Uh, built that company up in 2007, we were doing about 50 million in revenue that year, and Semantic bought the company for 350 million, and then I ran the team in Semantic for a year. And then, I was actually technically a year and five days, like when I was counting. Um, <laughs> and then, um, when I left, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Did I want to start another company? Do I want to not? Ended up deciding I was going to work with a bunch of early stage companies. So I started actually doing a little bit more of an angel active board member investing. And did that with about four or five companies. Uh, one is a company called Lookout in the mobile security space. Anyone with Android phone? 
uh, I suggest you get it. Um, I started working with them, there were six guys today, got 30 plus million users, uh, tens of millions in revenue, companies here in San Francisco, 200 people, a uh, company called Mobile Iron on the enterprise device management side, uh, and a few other companies. And then about a year ago, Greylock called and said, hey, we're in half of them now, we want to have a partner the enterprise team, got to know everybody and said, this is a no-brainer, I should do it. Uh, I'm also a husband, and I uh, have a nine-month-old beautiful daughter at home, so I'm a normal person, I change diapers, and uh, don't be, don't, just keep that in mind whenever you need to be seen. Um, what I thought I would do is basically go through my top 10 list of things that I think about when starting a company, which is also the things I think about when I'm investing in a company. And probably the very first thing that me as an entrepreneur I'm thinking about, or me as an investor I think about is, is the person sitting across the table. It is people first and strategy second. There are countless companies that got started and their original idea was to do X and they ended up doing Y. And the reason why they're able to, and then became very successful. And the reason why they were able to do that is because they got great people. And there's this whole debate in venture. Is it markets first or people first? And I'm a big believer that great people are gonna find great markets. And if you have a mediocre team that stumbles on a great market, a great team is going to figure that out and that ultimately beat the bad team. <laughs> so the, probably the very, very first thing, whether you're thinking about starting a company or, like again, if you're thinking about looking for venture capital is, why you? Like, what insight, what experience, what unique ability do you have in terms of what you're trying to build? I'll give you an example. Uh, Nir Zook. He's the founder of a company called Palatine Networks, just went public last summer, it's worth about three, four billion dollars per day. Started in our office. Nier had, had worked at Checkpoint, which is a big security company. Before that, he also started a, 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 another company in the intrusion um, detection space. The guy was like a no-brainer to start a security company. I mean, it was just like, it was obvious. Now you'd say, okay, yeah, well, you know, it's really hard if I've got this new idea of something but haven't started a company, how do I prove to you that I'm worthwhile? Well, oftentimes it's because you just have some unique insight or experience. It doesn't have to be that you've done it before. It doesn't have to be that you started the company. But we're usually looking to say, hey, why that person? Why is that person really good? Um, it could be that you come out of an industry that brings you a unique perspective. Or like when I was at Micromedia, the insight for me in terms of thinking about email as a marketing platform was we had all these people coming to download Shockwave, and we were getting tens of thousands of people a day coming to the site, which was the sixth most popular site on the internet back in 1996. And one day I asked the web team, saying, hey, let's capture people's email addresses and we can do marketing to them. And they said, great idea. Like, you know, two months later we had like a million people in this database, I'm like, great, let's do some marketing. And the only thing they had was this thing called Listserv. Have you ever seen Listserv? It's a pretty crappy tool to send emails. So I wasn't an email guy, I didn't know, I wasn't a direct marketing expert, but I'd seen this problem firsthand and said, hey, I can go solve it. So that's what sort of venture guys think about. And then I think if you're thinking about starting a company, like the thing you will spend more of your time on than anything else will be people. You're founding the company, you're the CEO of the company, you will spend more time on people more than any other topic. And you should. And the key things around people, and you know, just to uh, talk about the things that I think about as a founder, this was actually, this is a, the, the, quote, the, the, the first eight people in our first offsite had gone to, um, um, and this was us a couple of years later, about 200 people. And the things that I always think about, the first thing is hiring. <coughs> the most important thing you got to begin to spend your time is hiring. It's, it's finding great people to join your company. And there's a bunch of things that I always encourage people to think about when they're starting and thinking about hiring. The first is, there's two sides of hiring. There's this concept of technical competencies, and then there's this concept of relational competencies. And technical competencies are, um, does this person, if they're an engineer, do they know how to code Java or Node.js or Ruby on Rails? And you can test that, and you should test that. And getting to understand someone's technical competencies is key. It's actually shocking how many interviews are, don't actually get to the core question of someone's technical competency. There's this book called Peopleware. It's a book that was written like 30 years ago about managing creative organizations. It's a great book. Um, and there's this whole topic on recruiting, and it talks about the typical interview. And it uses the example of a juggler. A 
jump in the corner in the circus. And they said, you know, this is how a typical interview goes. The juggler shows up, sits across the desk from the you know, head of the circus. The head of the circus says, hey, can you juggle um, you know, three balls with one hand? No problem. Can you do five balls with two hands? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Can you do swords? Oh, no problem at all. How about flames? Well, I'm pretty good at it, but prefer the swords. And they're like, great, you're hired. How the interview should really go is the person should take three balls, put them across the table, and say, let me see you do it. And it's amazing how few interviews do that. I encourage everybody, when you're doing recruiting, figure out what those technical competencies are you're looking for, and figure out ways to give people a task to show that they can do it. And the second side of the recruiting for me is around relational competency, which is actually just as important as technical competency. And that's this sort of fluffy word that people call culture. There's a great book about Southwest, I think it's called The Southwest Way, which talks about this concept of relational competencies. And that's, what's the, what's the, what's the culture of the company, and how well will people fit? You, know, you want to have diversity of gender, and race, and backgrounds, and all that stuff is super important. But there's certain things which you don't want to have diversity on, which is how people interact. You know, Oracle has a certain culture, which is very different than Google's. And trying to mix those two is probably going to go in the wrong. So think about when you start your company, what kind of culture do you want to have? We sat down literally and said, look, here's the four or five key tenets of what we want for our culture. And then when we did our interviewing, we tried to figure out if people matched those. And one of the key things that we wanted is we wanted people that were really good communicators. We said, look, we want people that are good at presenting, they're, they're very open, they like to actually share information. So every single person who volunteered that we hired had to do a presentation in front of a group of people as part of the interview process. And it was fascinating how many people bombed. Like you'd say, oh, this person's going to do great to come in. And I know presentations are scary and nervous. Like, I'm nervous now. Uh, but figure out what things you're looking for, both in the technical side and the relationship topics, and really get to the core of whether people need that. It's amazing how people don't do that. So hiring is the most important thing you can do. The second thing that's really important for people in, in building a team is this, is this concept of and it was something that our head of HR, we hired, uh, Margie, taught me, which is I had always talked about retention. You hear this all the time, right? You guys all work in big companies, everyone working in big companies. It's about retention. We gotta retain our employees. That is such a horrible word. Retain. We gotta retain you. We hold you back. You know what a retaining wall is? It's a big wall they put up from the, the thing that would fall over. It doesn't seem like a really good way to think about employees, right? You know, I'm not thinking about handcuffs on the desk. So we think about this idea of engage. And if you think about all everyone on your team and you say, my job is to make sure that every single morning people choose to go back to the office or come back to work at the company, it changes your mindset. You start to think about all the things you need to do to make sure that it's a great place to work. And that means a lot about communications, it's a lot about thinking about people's careers, it's investing time in them. Um, you should assume that people have tons of opportunities and they're likely to leave. And also drive your compensation. And so I encourage everyone when you're thinking about building a team is to try to build a model where you're trying to figure out how to engage people and keep them excited. This is a very, very difficult way to manage. And then the last thing I want to talk about is, is the importance of firing people. Um, for some reason, for some reason, most managers, and I've been this way exactly myself, think that if I fire someone, it's going to have this bad impact on the rest of the company. Right? It's like, I don't want to fire the person. What is it going to say? People are going to be upset. Well, it turns out that like 99% of the time, people are actually wondering why you haven't actually fired the person. And it's actually causing more issues. Because they sit there and they probably know the issues more than you as a, as a manager does. And I encourage everybody to hire really, really slowly, fire them much more quickly. I'm not saying you should just sort of surprise people. Like you should give people opportunities. You should you know, be having a conversation on a regular basis with whether they're delivering or not and all these other things. But don't be afraid to fire people. Um, it's probably one of the biggest and most important things you can do to ensure a great culture in the company. Because everyone else who's working there, you know what's off? When they see someone that's not going their way, it's super frustrating to see that person who gets paid the same amount of money who's checking out at 4 o'clock and doesn't do a good job. I don't know about you guys, but I felt that. You know? So people first, strategy second, focus on hiring, engaging, firing. Any questions about that? 
So the question is, um, you know, firing is hard to do. You want to make sure that you give people enough of an opportunity, but how do you know when? And unfortunately, it's a little bit of an art. It's not a perfect science. Um, I think that the key thing is setting specific goals and, and, and objective measures for everybody. So for example, what I would always do with my team is, um, first, I make sure I sit down with them every single week. If I, if, I, if I could, if I couldn't for some reason, at least I was on the phone with them because I traveled a lot. Um, and I used to keep a little index card. Every single meeting I had an index card and I wrote down in that index card, what did we say we were gonna do this week and what did we say we were gonna do next week? And if I got like 10 of those index cards and realized that like they weren't getting their stuff done, it's pretty easy. Um, but you're right, but so, so, so I think setting those clear measures of objective, making sure that person understands them, it's amazing how many people don't even do that. So make sure you do that. And then the morale question, I have to be honest with you, there's no one I've ever fired where people were like, Oh my God, I can't believe you did that. This company sucks. Everyone's been like, oh God, thank you. What took you so long? So I, I, I just encourage you to just keep that in mind. Like, um, we tend to keep underperformers around a lot longer than we do. Because everyone's afraid to do it. You know, you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. So, any questions about that? Any questions? Yeah. Um, just, to, just to sort of take a step back into the people aspect, what about building a team? Beginning because it seems that that's yeah. actually probably the most critical thing. It, the right people together and getting started. It is, which is why I showed that first photo actually a little bit just to give some context around like, you know, getting started, it's, it's super, super hard. Um, so, a couple of thoughts. One, from the side of an entrepreneur, like, you want to, like, whoever you co found your company with, uh, you should be sure that, like, that person passes what I call the Hartford test. Anyone driven from New York to Hartford, Connecticut? Anyone ever do that? A couple of them? Anyone do that in a snowstorm? Yeah. So I did that, eight hours, in the car. We stopped at like Burger King, you know, and uh, having my co-founder. We had a great time, it was awesome. We missed the customer meeting, it was a total disaster. You really want to make sure those are the people that you choose are people that you know, will be in the bunker with you and, um, you just trust to no end. And so that bar should be super, super high for who your co-founders are. Ideally, it's people you know. It doesn't always have to be that way, but it's ideally people that you know. And then in terms of bringing on that first set of people, again, hire really slowly, be very rigorous, very rigorous around hiring. Um, and one of the things I also encourage is actually once you get past like the first five, 10 people, you should train people how to do recruiting. Most people have never been trained. Everyone does the same exact thing. They walk in with their resume, like, tell me about your background. Where did you go to school? What did you do with this job? Why did you go to this job? It's like, really? Like, that's the best we can do? Like, how about, what was the worst decision you've ever made in your life? Why did you make that decision? What did you, like, people need to learn how to do that. So, choose really wisely and invest with them. <coughs> that's the best advice I can give. Any other questions on people? Okay. Uh, so the idea, let's talk about the idea. Um, come, so like, you know, you, you're working on your idea, you've got a co-founder or co-founders, and you're brainstorming, you're on the whiteboard, you're drinking a ton of coffee, or maybe other things, and um, you're trying to figure out your idea. One of the things I always try to do, both when I'm starting companies, but also now that I'm an investor, is I look at the idea and say, is this thing gonna pass what I call the 10X test? A 10X test is, is it 10 times, at least 10 times better than the alternatives? That's super, super important because it turns out that people are really, really lazy and they don't like to switch. They just are. This concept of good enough happens all the time. Like the things that they're doing, it's good enough. It's not as big a deal. It's not that important. And so whenever you come up with your idea, you should like, make sure it passes the 10x test. And let's talk about Amazon because like, when Amazon got started, it definitely passed the 10x test. When Amazon started, the biggest bookstore approximately in the world. Physical bookstore had 10,000 books, which is a lot of books, by the way. There's actually a store 
in Canada called the world's biggest poster. That's the brand. Um, and it had like the most square footage of any bookstore. It's actually filing for chapter 11. Uh, uh, so the biggest bookstore had 10,000 10, books. And when Amazon launched, it had a million, and today it has 2.5 million. So like, just on that variable alone, they're like, well, we're going to be 10 times better because we're going to have 10 times more books than anyone on the planet, right? The concept of the world's biggest bookstore. And then Amazon layered on all these other awesome things about the experience of Amazon Prime, their customer support. I mean, it just, like, it's, they're just, they just were 10 times better. Because also, you couldn't really, at the time, even buy books on the internet. You couldn't really buy stuff. They were the first. So the alternative about walking down to the bookstore, finding the book, and seeing if you can have it, versus having it show up at my doorstep, was phenomenal. Phenomenal. So I always try to look at every idea and say, hey, is this thing going to be 10 times better? And you try to think, okay, well, you know, in, like in retail today, could you start a company and be 10 times better? And you can. You can actually beat Amazon. And there's companies that are doing it today. But they're figuring out very different ways of interacting. So for example, the Fab or One King's Lane that's actually focused on. Um, just a different, different way to, to sell stuff and to, and to have people buy. And then even companies that went vertical, like Diapers and Zappos, which eventually got bought by Amazon, they said, look, we're going to be better. And by the way, as a new parent, I can attest to the fact when it's 7 o'clock at night, I'm in diapers, like, like oh, no. Um, you shouldn't say, oh, crap. Uh, so you can, be, you, can, you can compete with the big guys. You just got to figure out what is that angle that's going to make them 10 times better, right? And when you're thinking about your idea, be really, really hard on yourselves to say, is this thing really going to be 10 times better? Is it really going to be 10 times better, if not 100 times better? And it doesn't mean you have to be first, by the way. It doesn't mean you have to First, Amazon was first, right? So that makes it easy. Um, how many people use Dropbox? Can you use Dropbox? <laughs> we're investors in it. It's a great company. Choose a great guy. They were not the first, but they just nailed it. They, their experience when they first came out with file sync across all the devices, it was ten times better. And then they figured out how to be ten times better in terms of growth with this concept of uh, having you invite your friends to join to get free storage. I mean, it's brilliant. I mean, they just went like this. So you don't have to be first to be 10 times better. Questions about that? Those are things that if you believed in the internet back in 1995, which not a lot of people did, um, you know, Jeff could make the argument, look, this is going to be radically new and radically different. It is 10 times better. And part of the job as an entrepreneur is you're going to have to sometimes sell that vision. The vision might not be right, by the way. But if you can't even tell the story of why it's going to be better, then you probably shouldn't. It's probably not going to pass the test. You're right. It's never perfect. And never Perfectly, but you shouldn't be able to explain why it's going to be better. Does that make sense? So once you sort of figure out what the idea is, um, when I started the company, I, when I started all my companies, I always tried to really think about like how do I boil down this idea to something that like my mom could understand. Even when I was doing security, it's like how can I explain this to my mom so she gets it very easily. And now as a venture <coughs> investor, I have to tell you, it's so much more important than I ever thought it was. Right? We get so much stuff coming at us every single day. It's really hard to keep up. Um, before I joined Greylock, I actually got this email from someone. And 
I said, hey, listen, I've got a great business idea. I'm going to revolutionize telecommunications. Well, that sounds pretty good. But, you know, <laughs> revolutionize telecommunications? I'll open this. So I'm reading this 20 page business plan. And um, I'm like, halfway, I'm like, what the heck are these guys doing? I get down somewhere in the middle, and it's like, they're going to sell phone cards on Facebook. <laughs> now, taking the merits of the idea off the table for a second, that doesn't pass the, the, the 10x test, um, but like, like the 10 second test, like why not explain that from the beginning? And I think it's super, super important when you're actually presenting your idea that you should be able to very succinctly and crisply describe your idea in a way that people are going to go, oh, I get that. Um, I actually took some examples. This is actually the, an example of Guy Kawasaki. Um, this mm -hmm. is Wendy's mission. Hamburgers. I'm going to talk about stuff we all appreciate. Um, superior quality, leadership, innovation, partnerships. That's what you guys think when you think of Wendy's, right? <laughs> this is what I think of. Way better, right? Because you know, they have quality in their name, good juicy burgers. You know, make it a lot simpler. Google. They're a little better, but I don't know about you. That's not kind of what I think about with Google. I kind of say, you know, look, it helps me find anything I want on the internet. Very, very different. Um, look out, the company I'm on the board of, people are like, look, we're going to be security for the post PC era. All those new devices that people have, we need to figure out a secure them before you help them do it. Now, this kind of sounds very pithy, right? It's like, okay, that's like pithy. Like, really, that's the level of what you as an investor want to do, and that's what you're suggesting we as entrepreneurs spend time on. There's actually a framework that I suggest people use. And it really forces you to actually help me answer a lot of other questions. And this is a framework that Jeffrey Moore, who wrote a book called Crossing the Chasm years ago, he was at um, uh, Regis McKenna, a very uh, 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 historical uh, PR firm that actually helped launch Apple and change the Apple logo to one that we have today, he set up the structure to say you should have this use this framework for positioning the product, which says who who's the product for to start with. And your target customer should be specific. Now there's very there's some companies which is like for everybody, but there's not many. So you should say who are you going after? And be very, very specific. And I'm going to go through the case study we'll talk to them. What's the really compelling reason to buy? Like, what's that either that massive pain that they have, or what's this incredible benefit they're going to get that they can't get otherwise? What your product is, and what's the category? And you're picking your product category is actually a really hard thing, especially in, sometimes in the enterprise space. Like, is there an existing category you want to say you're a part of? You want to create a whole new category? That's a question that comes up a ton in venture. And then what is that key, key benefit? One, this really forces you to be very crisp and clear. What's that key benefit that you're going to provide to them that they go, oh, I, I got to have it. And then pick a competitor. It's so important to pick a competitor. If there's no competition, generally speaking, like you either have to be really, 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 really early, which is rare. Or you're not really solving something that people care about. And the competition might not be another company. It might be just another way that people do business. And then what is your key, unique differentiator? Using this framework, I, I use it every single time I work with a company. It really helps you hone in on the key things that, especially also venture guys, are going to want to care about. They're going to want to know who you're going after, <coughs> what's the pain and problem you're trying to solve, all these things. Let me give an example of Vontu, a security company. I mean, can't be more geeky and nerdy than a security company. Um, and we tried to figure out how to like do this so that my mom could understand it. And where we ended up with it, and so here's, we sort of explain technically what we were doing. So technically we had software, the first version, set in the network of an enterprise, connected to their tap or their switch. Words already, you guys are like, what the hell is that? And it would actually capture all the packets going across the wire. It would actually just copy them to disk, and then it would actually crack open all the documents, put it into raw text, and do a really complex search algorithm to match it against content that we knew we didn't want to get out of the network. That's a mouthful. Not really going to be helpful to try and sell to a CIO. So when we went through the process, we said, okay, who are we going to go after? And initially we said, well, who's going to have the most pain? And we said, we're going to go after Fortune 1000 companies with lots and lots of customer data. 
reason for that was because there had been all these regulations that got passed, which is if someone lost your credit card number, they had to send you, an, you know, a letter. And no one wanted to be on the you know, front page of the New York Times saying they had a data breach. So it was Fortune, one, Fortune 1000 companies with lots of customer data. Who, and we went back and forth on things, we said, who want to stay off the cover of the New York Times? And this compelling thing, which we don't want to have an embarrassing situation. And then Vontu is a data loss prevention solution. We actually came up with a new category name. We spent a ton of time trying to come up with it. We tried to come up with a category name that people would get, data loss prevention. I've got data, and I want to prevent the loss of it. That is more accurate than any other solution out there. So our big thing in terms of our key benefit is accuracy. And then, unlike our main competitors, we picked this question of being able to scale to the Fortune 1000, which is our first customer was Bank of America. We had 200,000 people who were monitoring all the network. So that's where we started. Now this can change over time. Like, you know, eventually we added things like source code protection and other things, but it gave us a framework for making tons of decisions and explaining to, to our investors and, and to, the, to the company what our focus was. So strongly encourage you guys to use this. Questions about it? Yeah. Should your uh, initial uh, sort of uh, beta or minimum viable product Yeah, so the question is, um, in this, this world of thinking about minimum viable products, so minimum viable products work, I think, really well in the consumer market. They don't work too well when you're selling to Bank of America. Like, they don't really want a minimum viable product. You know, they kind of want, like, you know, a minimum great product. Uh, so the trick there is to have to figure out minimum great versus minimum viable. Viable things like, I'm just going to be making it. You know, so so that's, that's one thing I'll say. Um, but absolutely, I mean, like, when we started, to be honest, we wanted to do the entire network stack, but we started just by focusing on email and web traffic. So we made decisions about what we actually delivered in the first version, and I think you have to make those trade-offs all the time. And we knew we were gonna actually do other things. So, I mean, eventually we have software that sits on people's laptops and monitors data being copied from USB drives and all this other stuff. We knew we were gonna get there, but we didn't confuse the initial focus and positioning <coughs> with where we were gonna get. Could we describe that aspirationally when we raised money? Absolutely. I mean, we talked about this idea. But we said, look, our initial focus is X. We think there's this massive, massive thing here, but we're going to focus here, and we're going to get traction, we're going to get this set of customers, and yeah. Yep. Um, in the case of want to, when you talked about who wants the needs, uh, did you focus the did you focus your value proposition on the business person or the IT person? Yeah, the sure. business value proposition. That's kind of like what we are also going through and trying to figure out how you guys yeah. thought about it or want to. Question: We were an enterprise software company, so did we focus on the IT technical person or did we focus on the business person? Um, so the first level messaging for us was always the business person because you know what they actually controlled the checkbook ultimately, and it was really targeting towards really senior execs. I mean, we were trying to get to the CEO if we could. Um, and we often did, because we were dealing with such sensitive stuff. But we had a whole raft of messaging and positioning and content that we knew we had to sell to the IT guys to convince them that it was a great solution. Um, but if we tried to sell to the IT guys, like imagine if I was trying to sell you something that said, hey, we're gonna monitor your network and tell you about all the stuff that's leaking out, and I know you're in charge of security and it's not supposed to be happening, so you, you wanna try it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you have to tell your boss about it too. That didn't usually go over too well. So what I typically did was I sold to the business guy, and I just like, look, you probably don't have a problem. Install the software, try it. If you don't have a problem, great. If you do, wouldn't you like to know? And the business guy would always tell the tech guy, you should just try it, make sure, right? So that's what we did. <laughs> and it was great, by the way. We never had one customer that didn't have stuff leaving. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, you know, how do you get to this compelling reason to buy or to use? Uh, and it varies a little versus consumer versus enterprise. I mean, consumer, it's a little easier. You can release stuff out to the market. You can get people trying it. You can measure it, and you can sort of see. 
um, with this concept of what we've called minimum viable product. You put something out there and you sort of see, and you keep tweaking it, and then when you have a certain set of metrics, you can sort of say, this is starting to work, and I can figure out how to get there. And the enterprise side is a little bit harder, so what we did is we went out and just talked to 40 different companies. Um, before we even started, yeah, we had, we had an idea of what we were doing. Uh, we actually changed it after we did the discussions, but we just went out and talked to people. We, I mean, you guys have such an advantage today with LinkedIn that we didn't have. Like, honestly, like I was um, trying to figure out email addresses, you know, just emailing into companies to try to get to people. I mean, it's that you know hard. But we just sat down with a ton of people, and the key thing that we did in that process was we didn't just ask them, "Hey, is this a, like we worry about stuff leaving." The key question you have to ask them is, "How does it compare relative to everything else you have going on?" And when we started Bontu, we went to a company here in San Francisco that will remain nameless, but we went in, we're having the meeting, we're talking to them how we're gonna monitor their network for sensitive stuff leaving, and the head of security said, huh, interesting, yesterday I got an email from the CEO asking why his email to the whole company got into the local newspaper. I'm like, so how important is this relative to everything else you got going on? It's like, pretty important. I was like, great, okay. So that's a key thing that I would always make sure the second level question that gets answered. We did, and I suggest you do. We had an idea of what the product was, and we were in parallel. Like the, I had two technical founders who were working on the product in terms of the prototype, but we had spent a bunch of time trying to do the research before, and then in parallel we were building that prototype, and then we raised money. Yeah, yeah. Um, some people have tried to describe this in terms of another company, say, you know, we have an Instagram video or things like that. <laughs> How useful is that? Like some people really get it, but a lot of times you have an outside setting up this other company that's working against what the other is. It helps. It definitely helps to sort of do some comparison of like we're this for that. Um, it does usually raise a bunch of questions um, uh, more than it helps. I mean, it helps just to sort of give some context, but I still think you need to really explain like, okay, what's the value proposition? Because every company is different, right? Um, there were a lot of people that tried to say they were on Instagram and video, and it hasn't really happened yet. So why is that? It's not necessarily valid. Just because Instagram was successful doesn't mean that the comparable model would be successful with video. So it's yet to prove. Yeah. One is. Um, more t traditionally, when I think about it in the enterprise space, the benefit is much more value oriented um, in terms of like some you know, problem that you're helping to solve, and the other one's more comparative, right? So it's it's they're close, and it, it is a little um, it's hard to necessarily get those two right. Those are the two that I always struggle with, to be honest with you. Um, but I try to actually one may be more of a product feature, and one may be more benefit. specifically who in the enterprise is buying all the time, both when I'm looking to invest as well as when I started things. I think it's really important that there's someone that is responsible in the company. If there isn't, there's usually a reason why, which is that it's not that it's not that important relative to everything else. So for security, most Fortune 1000 companies have a chief security officer. And we knew that that was a person we were going to talk to all the time. Yeah. You have to sort of, you, know, you have to talk to anyone who might be the buyer, and different organizations are all structured differently. The person that may be making a technical decision, you kind of, you, you want to just have to cast a really wide net in that area of what you're focused on, and you'll learn a ton actually in that process. So I wouldn't limit it per se. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so going back to the when you say, say that we want to finish it to the company and the one in the position of the Correct. How you just relative to the company. 
competitive thing. So what's the, and here's the benefit to you. We're going to accurately provide all this data. And by the way, because you're Fortune 1000, we can scale to your network needs and our competitors can't. Right? Great. Um, <laughs> One billion dollars. One billion. Oh, billion. Um, so this is an important thing to understand if you're going to go raise venture capital. And this sort of gets the seed stage venture capital funding, et cetera. And it also helps when you're thinking about starting a company for yourself, which is if you're going to do and you think you're going to do a venture-backed company, be very specific about that. Because you could do, you could do a startup. It doesn't have to be a technology company. It doesn't. You, know, you can go open um, uh, friends of uh, ours. Um, she started a company called Fresh Yogurt, which anyone's ever had it. It's this great yogurt shop. She's got three or four shops now in the area. She's doing a startup. It's not a venture backed company. So I'm talking specifically about venture backed companies. This concept of building a company that can be worth a billion dollars is a really important hurdle. When I would think about starting a company, I would always think about can I get a company to 100 million in revenue? Do I think if I start this company, I can see the path that I can do 100 million dollars in revenue? That was always like my bar. So we started Vontu, I said, okay, if we can sell this thing for three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars a pop, then we can get a certain percentage of the global two thousand ultimately. So I think I can get to hundred million in revenue. And the answer was yes. And because if you can get to hundred million in revenue and you can sort of show that reasonably you can do that, so when you go talk to a venture investor, the thing that they're thinking about is could this be a company that's worth a billion dollars? If you look at the public company comps today, hundred million dollars in revenue, the multiples. A billion dollar company, if not more today. And that's really important because the business of venture capital for, for I'll call it sort of the top tier venture firms, we're in business, like, so Greylock has a billion dollar fund. Our goal is to deliver five to ten times that back to our investors. We have to deliver five to ten billion dollars back on one fund. Really hard to get there at 50 million dollars a pop. So if you think about sort of the venture business, it's not even the 80-20 rule, it's like the 95-5. 95% of all the returns typically come from like four or five companies. We'll do 30 investments, five deliver all the results. Three deliver all the results. And if you sort of follow what's going on in the venture business, it's actually a really interesting and challenging problem. That, uh, like when I, before I joined Greylock, I talked to one, uh, a large endowment and asked them in my due diligence, I said, Tell me about Greylock and the venture business. Like, do you have lots of investments? Is this a multi-billion dollar endowment? And he said, look, Joseph, I'm going to tell you, we have 60 venture capital investments. Five firms deliver all the returns. So if you're thinking about raising venture capital, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the venture capitalist and what their business is, which is we're looking for things that are really going to move the needle. Really going to move the needle. This has got to be a company we think has a chance of being worth a billion dollars. Believe me, not every company has up there. Very few do. But in terms of thinking about how you position and message, you'd have to show a reasonable path, which sort of gets to the financials question. It's not really about showing the financials. It's actually much more qualitative than that. It's this is a really big pain. Here's how we tried to validate it. Here's data that shows that we can scale this thing over some period of time. Whether we get there in five years or 10 years, doesn't really matter. If we can get there, that's what matters most. And because of that, we think we can be worth a lot of money. That's the really important part of the equation. Now, this gets this whole seed investing versus venture investing. A lot of people tell you, don't go talk to those venture capitalists. Like, you can go, you can start this company, you can sell it for $50 million. I'm going to talk about exit strategies as a really bad idea in a minute. Um, I really believe that. So I'm cramping a little bit. The only strategy you can have is a success strategy. Like if you see what's going on right now, there's all this data about all these seed investments that got made. Look how many companies are having a hard time raising their next round of funding. It doesn't mean that seed's bad. We actually have a seed fund we run called Greylock Discovery. I think we've invested in we've invested tons and tons of companies. We invest 100K, 200K, 300K. We do it all the time. But you have to have a path when you're doing seed funding to get to the next level of funding. <coughs> it's not like you can skip a step just because you can get easier access to capital. You ultimately still have to show if you're going to raise venture capital, because I don't know a lot of seed funds or seed, seed funded companies that don't eventually need venture capital in the traditional sense. You have to get there. 
So make sure you're soft answering this question, both for you yourself too, because you want to go do something that's going to be have a great outcome. So yeah. The billion dollar figure in how many years? Two years? Five years? Five to ten. Five. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've got companies that take ten years. Some will take longer. I mean, Pandora is a great example. That company, holy cow, was started like I think in the late nineties, and only went public in two thousand and eleven. It was, it was, it was, I was 11, 11 years, or 12 years in that case. And Tim, like, <laughs> maxed out his credit cards like 20 times to fund the company himself. I mean, he had passion about what he was doing. It took a long time, but it's OK. Yeah? It seems like there's a lot of companies, though, that are like, focused on building just users. And so they say, let's think about more about the money later. Yep. So how do you sort of balance those, those two things? Yeah. It's a good question. The question is, um, a lot of companies, especially on the consumer side, they focus on, like, I'm going to get a bunch of users. So a little history. We invested in Facebook. We were the second investors. Excel was the first institutional investor. We were we invested the second investors. We invested in a company at a $500 million valuation in, like, 2005. And they still were just my college campuses. MySpace was massive. David Z, who is um, an awesome investor and a really wickedly smart guy, believed that, one, the product was better, Mark was a better entrepreneur, and uh, ultimately we could figure out a way to monetize. And so he had that sort of belief and vision. Everybody thought he was crazy. Everybody thought he was crazy. Uh, and you know, it turned out to be just a huge home run. So venture guys, investors, especially good investors, which is also, get, by the way, back going back to the team question at the beginning, your investors, are a very special member of your team because that last bullet of firing them, you can't really do. So make sure you choose them wisely. <laughs> um, and so this question about like how do you sort of figure out get, how to get valued is you kind of go, when you're thinking about raising money, you should be very strategic about who you're choosing. And you want to choose someone who understands your space so that they can make the mental leap to get to, yeah, this is going to be a huge, it has the potential to be a huge billion dollar outcome, right? So if you're doing, I mean, look, we just invested in this thing called Nextdoor. Has anyone heard of Nextdoor? A couple people? Okay. It is basically trying to build a social network for your neighborhood. The idea is that you've got physical boundaries of where you live, and you don't really know your neighbors, so why not create a social network that can connect you up with the people that live next door to you because you probably don't even know them today. And, you know, we did, Benchmark did the Series A after starting out as a different company. It was actually doing something like <coughs> sports fans. That failed. <laughs> they pivoted to say, oh, well, let's do a social network for neighborhoods, and then we invested in it. And you know, we see that it's going like this. And you know, Mirov, who's a really great entrepreneur, uh, I just met with him recently, and we were talking to him, he's like, he's like, we're not we have no idea how we're gonna make money. We're just building a user base, and now we've got you know thousands and thousands and thousands of neighborhoods, and they figured out the trajectory. But we know if we can create the social network for your neighborhood and connect up neighborhoods and, and, and connecting neighborhoods. Huge opportunity in local commerce. We don't know how we'll do it, we don't know how we'll sell for we don't know any of that stuff. But we can see it. So that's the thing. <coughs> yeah. So uh, with this approach, are you sort of encouraging companies to pay extreme risky approaches as opposed to being a safer thing and passing on that? Or is there a way that you should actually manage to do that approach as well? I think that this question about risk begins to um, you know, and this question on safety versus risky. Um, startups are all about risk mitigation over time. Like you're constantly mitigating risk and trying to figure out how to lower risk and answer questions that you don't know the answers to over time. And I think what we encourage people to do is the thing you do has got to be ten times better, right? So if it's just incremental, unlikely to get tons of traction. So you're never going to get to this point, right? So like when Nier started Palo Alto Networks, it was a next generation firewall. Firewall, firewalls, it's this thing that you put in your network that you know, stops people from coming in. Um, had been around forever. But he and the team had a unique insight that was going to say, well, our approach is going to be way better than the alternatives into an existing massive understood market. So where was that very, very risky? Well, absolutely, in some ways. Yes, we knew that there was a massive market, so that like market risk was low. But like, could they build a product and would it work and would customers buy it? It's still really high. So you want to have enough risk that you can deliver value. And if you're just doing the incremental stuff, it probably isn't going to actually be Yeah? So you guys have the market 
So again, that comes down to, it's usually a product thing, like is your product going to be way better? So the Palo Alto Networks example is a really valid one where we felt really confident we are going to build a product which was going to be so much better that we could capture a big share of that. And we believed in the entrepreneur who had been there before and knew what he was doing. So those are the two things that we thought about there. Now sometimes there's new products that come into the enterprise. Like Salesforce.com, when it came out, that was a huge question mark if people were going to actually, I mean, it was, you know, CRM and Salesforce automation was big, but it was a big question mark if people were going to actually put their data in the cloud. Today, we can take that for granted. But, you know, that was a big technical product risk that people took and came up with people. Any more questions on this? No. Try to, I got six more to go, but there's some of them are easier. Uh, the, one of the other big questions that's really important is this question about why now. Um, I think I mentioned earlier I worked on this thing called Newton. Um, maybe you guys remember this thing? Anyone there? Do people remember you know what this thing was? I'm getting old. Uh, so this came out in 1993. Came out from Apple. And the idea was it was like this tablet and you had this little stylus and you could write on it and you could write on the screen. And it would actually recognize your handwriting. And we said, no one is ever going to want to type on a little keyboard with their thumbs. We just thought, no one would ever want to do that. Well, that was a mistake. Um, and so it's a big question here about why now with respect to, is the technology ready? And it turned out that handwriting recognition was not going to be that good. Uh, we actually got lampooned by Gary Trudeau for a whole week, which was a little embarrassing, where he was trying to write on it. And he would, like, he'd write things, and he would come up with these really funny expressions. Actually, so people make big It's like worse than Siri, at least people were buying the iPhone. Um, and, um, and we met this company, uh, this company came out called Palm. This guy, Jeff Hoffman, it was a little software company, and they had this way to do handwriting recognition. It was the number one most popular app for Newton, and it was this thing called Graffiti, which you guys probably remember. We sort of it did handwriting recognition, but it was like you had to sort of learn different ways to write the characters, and it worked great. They said, you want to buy the company? We'll sell it to you. I'm like 20 people. I'm like, no, 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 we'll figure it out. The technology's gonna get there, we're gonna work out. Well, you know, the history there. You know, they went out and started this company, you probably all had pop pilots at one point in your life, and no one of you guys ever had an Apple Newton. Now, granted, Apple eventually came around and did get success in the handheld market. Um, but this question about why now is really important when you're when you're starting a company and raising money, both in terms of the technology, like what about the technology today is causing some change in terms of how people are going to interact, behave, communicate, do business, um, or some market transition that's happening. Lower cost of bandwidth, the cloud, being all those kinds of things. So I think one of the key questions to ask, especially when you're doing something early, is why now? An example that I had on the business side that I've, I've had a bunch of failures, new was one. Um, I invested in this company in 2000 called Backplane that was doing a billing cloud company. The thought was in 2000, everything's moving to the cloud, people are going to need to do billing. Let's do a billing company as a cloud service. We were way too early in the market. There weren't enough cloud providers. wasn't enough market potential. September 11th happened. We couldn't raise money in the company. So timing is actually important, and you should be comfortable ask, answering that question when you're raising money or when you're starting your company. Questions about that? Um, one of the key things both that I try to do and instill in the company and also when we're meeting with entrepreneurs, is stay humble and stay hungry. It is shocking how many people uh, either, when they're first getting started, they come in, I had this one entrepreneur come in, he'd never done anything, he was in his 20s, starting this interesting company, meet with him, he's like, you know, we don't really need your money. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I know that, by the way, because there's a lot of other people that give you money, I get just so turned me off. It took me a lot to sort of like, okay, do I really want to spend time with this person? Like, you don't need to be cocky. You don't need to be arrogant. You want to be confident, right? You want to be confident in what you're doing. But the, thing, the key thing with venture guys is we actually really appreciate when someone says, you know, I don't know the answer to that question yet. I don't know. But here's what I think, and here's how I'm going to figure it out. Like, that is so much more valuable than someone going, it's going to be this, and I'm positive about it. It's like, Really? Okay. You know, stay home and stay hungry. And it also really reflects when you're out there trying to meet with customers and partners. And I was, um, I, I just think that you should just be 
incredibly respectful of everybody. I, and it's just shocking how, when entrepreneurs, especially when you start to get some success in the company, that people get really cocky and arrogant because they think, oh my God, we're growing. Well, you know what? Every single company's growth curve slows at some point. I, I'm shocked at how many people come in and say, yeah, we're going to grow like this forever. It's like, you're not going to grow at 100% year over year forever. You're just not. <laughs> at some point, it stops. You know. So just this is super important, and that's just a thing I just tell everyone to keep in mind. Um, focus. <clears throat> The, the, the hardest thing inside of a startup I've always found is like what you're actually going to say yes to. Like that should be the way you think about it. It's like what are the two things we're going to say yes to? I'm going to give you an example of a really hard decision we had to make it on to. We had um, we were just launching. We got this two-minute segment on CNBC around this insider threat problem. We're trying to raise awareness of this problem of people inside of companies that were sending data out. And so we got this two-minute piece about the space and interviewed us about it. And we were like 15 people. We didn't have any customers. We were still building the product. And I got a phone call, a first inbound phone call from a customer, a potential customer. First insurance company of Hawaii. I'm psyched. I'm like, this is great. Got the customer inbound. Get on the phone with the head of security there. He's like, yeah, you know, we're really worried about this. And we've got all these customer data, all this customer data, and we want to um, figure out a way to solve it. I was like, great. Um, how, how big is the company? It's like we're 500 people. Okay, that's not quite global 2000. Um, I'm like, how much do you think you're going to spend? He's like, probably 10 or 20 thousand dollars. We had sort of done our model that we were building enterprise Salesforce. We needed to sell stuff for at least 100 thousand dollars for it to be profitable. And here I am on the phone with a live customer in Hawaii, which you know that was a benefit. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I and I, I said to him, I said, you know, honestly, I can't help. And he's like, well, why? I was like, well, honestly, I can't actually really do it profitably. And, you know, like, here's the reasons why. I hung up the phone and never heard from it again. Super hard. I had to go raise money in about six months. I didn't have any customers. But remember, we had done that framework. We said, look, we're going to, going to focus on the Fortune 1000. We're going to focus on financial services and insurance. Well, that was good, but not Fortune 1000. Couldn't pay the amount we needed to prove. And I knew that selling to first insurance company in Hawaii would be just as hard as selling to Bank of America. Not, maybe not quite as hard, but like 80% as hard. So we need to focus and stay true to our mission and say, look, we're going after the Fortune 1000 and be maniacally focused on that until we knew otherwise. Really hard decision. Totally the right thing. A month later, we get an RFP from Bank of America looking for a solution to do what we do. We're like, Perfect. We're 15 people. We took a whole company, like, like all going to figure out how to go sell Bank of America. A month later, they said, hey, we want to work with you. We signed a deal two months after that. We're off to the races. We got Bank of America, Golden Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Citigroup, Merrill Lynch, JP Morgan Chase, Prudential, New York Life, Allstate. You know, the list goes on and on and on. Right decision. Really hard. Focus is key. Somebody have a question? Yep. Yeah, focus is very important. Start like, like their strategy becomes like peanut butter, right? They take all their money and funds and effort and they just slather it all across the bread and like that doesn't really work that well. And the thing about a startup is you gotta start somewhere and you gotta go take some hill. And I'm a big believer that the best way to sort of light a field on fire with a thousand matches is not to take a thousand matches and spread them out through the field, but it's to take all thousand, put them in the corner and light them right there and like that start the field on fire. So I agree with you, but it should only happen when the thing that you said you were gonna do isn't working. Or you see some other piece of data that says, oh crap, there's actually a way bigger hill over here. 
and we should go do that. And by the way, what you should do in that case is then you stop doing this other stuff. Because what, what happens is people start to do this, and they do that, a little of this, a little of that. Before you know it, there's no focus. It's all the wood behind one arrow gets lost. OK. Uh, there's a whole thing on this, which I would get to, but we're running out of time, which is key thing I tell every company is have three to five wildly important goals. Write them down. Keep them on a rolling 12-month basis with specific measures of success for each of them. Make sure your board understands them. Make sure everyone in the company understands them. And just keep, that's, that is the mantra for the company. Whenever you're meeting with your exec team, that's what you're talking about. How are we doing against those three to five goals? When you have your board meetings, I would always start every board meeting and say, here's our three to five goals. Here's how we're doing. Here's what's working. Here's what's not. People would bring up other stuff. I'd say, you know what? It actually doesn't help us towards these three to five goals. We're not going to do it. We're not going to talk about it. Focus, really important. Um, the other key thing I tell everyone is, look, your, your customers become, they're like your best salespeople, whether it's a consumer company or an enterprise company. Figure out how you can turn your customers into evangelists. On the consumer side, that is known as virality. How do you get some sort of virality in your product? And by the way, I believe that virality works in the enterprise too. It's called word of mouth virality. We sold B of A. When we went to Citigroup, which was bigger, we sat down with Citi and you know, we signed a multi-million dollar deal with them. We sat down with them. They were competitors in the marketplace. We said, look, we've got B of A, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and Merrill Lynch is our first couple of customers in your space. We want to talk to them. So I called up B of A and I was like, how's it working? They're like, we love it, it's great. Did you look at the competitors? Yes, these guys are really better. They only brought our product in and within 60 days afterwards, we signed a multi-million dollar PA with us. Like, that doesn't really happen that often. But it's because we made B of A so happy same thing happened on the consumer side. Really focus on support, really focus on getting highly engaged people, measure it using a thing called Net Promoter Score. People have heard of this. You know, on a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to refer someone to use this product or service? Incredibly valuable, keeps you honest. Key to success. We actually ask companies when we're doing later stage rounds, do they have an NPS score for their customers as a measure of how well the company's doing? Key thing. Last. Oh, last two points. Um, this question about seed investing, like people say, oh, take a seed investment, you can go sell your company for $15 million. And I've sold a bunch of companies, so I have experience. It is the stupidest strategy in the world to have an exit strategy. Like, it drives me crazy when people ask, like, what's your exit strategy? Like, when I was interviewing people to join the company, they say, what's your exit strategy? I'm like, we don't have one. Like, why do you ever have an exit strategy? And the only strategy you can ever have is a success strategy. You build a successful company, and you will have options. You will have options to keep building the company successfully, and when you're successful, people will come by and try to buy the company. You can't build a company to package it to, if you can, it's not, I wouldn't recommend it, that you build a company just with the sole purpose of trying to get it acquired. It's, um, it's, um, it's, you're, it's very, very, it's like too risky, you shouldn't do that. Questions on that one? All right, last one. If you're going to do a startup, you better love it. Um, it is one of the hardest things you can do. Uh, when I was starting Montu, um, we were getting started. We've been working on it for about six, seven months. We're about to go raise funding. And uh, I love to ride my bike. I was riding with a buddy. We went over the Golden Gate Bridge, and we went up that road that goes up the headlands that has a great view of the Golden Gate Bridge. Anyone gone down the back side of that road? It was Easter morning. The road was wet. We're going down about 25 miles an hour, rear wheel slips out, 25 miles an hour, into the barricade, break my back, push her along, break three ribs. In the ICU for three days, not sure if I can walk. I'm about to start a company. It's crazy. Uh, I remember calling my two co-founders about a day later when the morphine was wearing off. <laughs> I think. And, uh, and I say, and you know, I'm in bad shape and I'm not going to be able to raise money yet. And uh, I knew I still wanted to do it, you know, even though I was going through this whole thing. And uh, uh, about six weeks later, I'm out of the hospital, Benchmark, actually, Dinner Series A, the partner there actually came to my house because I couldn't drive yet. I heard the pitch while I was laying on my couch. Um, so I, was really, I really like it. Uh, and uh, I'm fine. I didn't have any surgery. I can walk fine. I ride my bike still. 
Um, but the process of starting a company has tons of ups and downs. You know, people joke it's back breaking. No one realizes that you could break your back while doing it. But um, <laughs> you really, really should love it because, especially if you're the CEO and the founder, you go through this massive emotional roller coaster. A massive emotional roller coaster. And there's really not many people you can talk to. You can hopefully talk to your co-founders, but even then, at times you can't if you're the CEO. Um, so just make sure that you love what you're doing because the likelihood of success is very low. So if the only reason why you're doing it is because you want success versus actually the process of creation, don't do it. But if you love it, it's a great, great process and it's a great community. And I'd love to hear about your great ideas. So thank you guys very much.